Welcome back to another episode of Local Search Tuesdays. This week, the video is a bit longer than usual because I'm sharing a presentation I did a few weeks ago for the Better Business Bureau. I don't want to waste too much time setting this up. The presentation is about 45 minutes long, so grab a drink and a snack and get ready to learn some awesome stuff. So this is how to show up in local searches in a post-COVID landscape and beyond. You know, I work at Search Lab. You know, outside of COVID, I speak at a lot of conferences. I'm traveling all the time all over the world speaking at things. When COVID hit last year and they closed down all the conferences, I already had 28 conferences booked in eight different countries. So I'm lucky enough that I get to go all over the world to speak at a lot of conferences, but also that means I see a lot of different people that are speakers. And unfortunately, sometimes, and I'm sure you've seen this in online presentations and virtual things in the last year, that some speakers aren't really that entertaining to watch. And you know, at the conference, they're just locked behind the podium and they stand there super stiff and they'll most of the time kind of have their back to the audience and just read their own slides and it's really not engaging. And even worse, the background of the slide is just plain white and it's black aerial font and there's just lots and lots of bullet points and they just read bullet point after bullet point and it's really boring and it's just awful, even if the information is good. So because of that, I firmly believe that bullet points kill kittens and today's presentation is going to be entirely kitty safe. And you hopefully maybe noticed that that was the movie Contagion there at the beginning. I was a film major, like you mentioned, and I'm really obsessed with movies. So I love to share my love of movies every time I talk and share my love of SEO. So there's always a theme. And today's theme is, ah, it says car movies there. I was working on multiple presentations. I messed that up. Sorry. Today's theme is actually sci-fi movies. So we have 125 references to science fiction movies. And another thing that I do is I go back and I include at least one movie for every year in the last 50 years. But today we're going back 53 years because if we're doing sci-fi, come on, I got to have every Planet of the Apes movie in there. So we got to go back 53 years. I know there's some obscure stuff that you won't have seen. So there is attribution over to the side on all these slides. So not only will you learn some cool stuff about showing up better in Google today, you're going to have a really kick-ass list of movies to go watch. So let's kick this off. Are you here today because you need a hand with showing up better in local searches? Are you spending too much time looking up at competitors that rank higher than you in search results? Unfortunately, Google's a really tough puzzle to crack and there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things you have to understand. And Unfortunately, in today's post-COVID landscape, you can't just hope that your website's going to be enough and float along with just your site. You have to put effort into showing up better in searches. Because if you put in minimal effort or no effort and you're trying to just float along, you're going to basically blend into the background. And if you blend into the background, you're going to be virtually invisible to potential customers. So I don't want to freak you out, though. There is effort involved, but it's not that hard. So don't lose your head. I'm going to share some awesome tips with you guys today. And I'm sure you've probably read a lot of things online or watched other videos online. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is just basically a giant pile of crap. So I'm going to help you dig through the giant pile of crap that's out there on the internet and actually show you the code behind Google's algorithm so that you'll understand what you need to do to show up better in local searches. So it's important that we start off by talking about how Google actually works. If you really boil it down to the simplest concept, Google is really just pattern detection. It's evaluating patterns of signals, both on your site and off your site to evaluate what's gonna be a better search result. So then when somebody enters a, a search phrase, a query, a couple of words up to a long sentence in Google, Google's going to look at the intent of that search query, and then it's going to give you search results that are displayed based on two major factors, relevance, and prominence. So relevance, is this something that matches the criteria that you're looking for? If I'm looking for a car dealership, hey, is this a car dealership or not? If it is, cool, it makes the list. Once it's got that list of websites that match the attributes I'm looking for, it's then going to sort that list in order of importance based on prominence. So it's going to use the weight that it has assigned to the various factors and it's going to determine which site is really the best answer to the question that I'm asking. And that's the one that's going to show up, up at the top. But showing up well in searches isn't just about using the right keywords throughout your site. And that's a pretty common misconception. 
In today's landscape, you have to answer the question. It's all about, like I said, the intent of that searcher. You have to think about what people are looking for when you're potentially a search result, and you have to answer the question that that person is asking. And then it's not just about answering the question, it's about answering the question and being the best answer to the question. So you can't just say, hey, I'm a plumber and I unclog toilets. You have to talk about why you are the best solution in the local area to be that plumbing solution for potential clients. And in today's post-COVID landscape, every single customer comes to you because they started that process, they started that journey with a search on Google or one of the other search engines. And COVID has changed customer behavior at a pretty fundamental level. And a lot of studies have been done that show that that change in customer behavior is a permanent change. So a lot of the things that people are doing now that they weren't doing a year and a half ago, they'll continue to do moving forward. The buy local trend is really accelerating. The big box stores are less and less popular as people want to spend more effort and more money supporting the local mom and pop, the local small business. So you don't have to be one of those e-commerce giants. Local businesses can absolutely win all of the customers in an area with just some simple local SEO tactics. So I want to start really digging into some stats from some recent studies that have come out talking about this change in user behavior. So we kind of have a frame for the things I'm going to talk about later that will explain what you need to do to show up better. So a study from Accenture showed that 46% of consumers are more likely to shop in neighborhood stores that are closer to their homes. And then 59% of consumers are more likely to use curbside pickup even when COVID restrictions have been lifted and we're able to kind of approach a sense of what we would consider to be normalcy. And then 50% of consumers have decided where they're going to shop based on whether or not they can actually pick it up in store. So that's a change of before people were perfectly happy ordering from Amazon or Best Buy or whatever the big box store is and waiting for it to be shipped to them, where now half of people want to be able to get it now. They want to be able to purchase it locally and pick it up now. And then 56% of consumers say that they rely on reviews to make their informed purchase decisions faster. So reviews are that kicker that's gonna help someone decide to come buy from you and not from a competitor. And then this is a really big one. 70% of internet users are now using their smartphones more as a direct result of the pandemic and all of the lockdowns. And the really important bit about this is anytime you do a search on a mobile device, even if you don't enter in any sort of geographic location term in your search query, those search results, results are going to be localized to your specific location of where you are when you did that search, either by the GPS in the phone or by triangulation of cell phone signal or by looking at the IP address of the Wi Fi network that you're connected to. So if we know that any searches on a mobile device are going to be localized, we know we need local SEO because local SEO is going to target that specific algorithm because Google has different algorithms and Google knows based on the particular type of vertical that we're looking at or the type of search query we're looking at, that even if you don't specify it with a location keyword, you still want results in a local area and it's gonna use that local algorithm. And it's different from the regular algorithm. So. Anytime you're looking at things online or, or trying to learn about what you need to do to show up better in Google searches, you need to pay attention to whether it's just general SEO or local SEO, because local SEO is more complex. There are additional signals involved that the algorithm looks at that traditional SEO doesn't have to worry about. So local search results actually add in another factor beyond relevance and prominence. So those search results in local searches are relevance, prominence and proximity. So real world location plays into how you're gonna show up in potential local searches. Couple of important notes before I really dig into specific topics. Number one, SEO is a marathon, not a sprint. The things that you do today to optimize your site are going to affect your visibility a couple of months from now and everything works together like a bunch of gears all turning together to make the engine work. 
to produce results in the future. It's not like paid search or PPC where you put budget and money in now and you get immediate results. It takes time for SEO to work. So you have to invest for the long term. You can't look at SEO as something that you put some money into now and you want to see results in a month or two. Another important thing to really consider is a lot of business owners typically don't really understand SEO. So they're just going to go for the cheapest option. But in actuality, the cheapest option is the most expensive option. With SEO, it's almost like an attorney, except instead of every little thing costs you more money, it's it's more of a time-based function than a product-based function. You're paying for butts and seats to sit there and do the work. And showing up in Google searches is the most important thing you can do from a marketing standpoint for any business out there that serves customers on a face-to-face -face basis. So you don't want to go with the cheapest option. You want to go with someone that actually understands. And I know that the, the guys kind of prepped me and said, one of the big questions they always get is, you know, what sort of investment should you make? And when it comes to, to local SEO and just SEO in general, you should really expect to spend at least 2000 2500 bucks a month. Anything cheaper than that, there's just no way that the person is spending enough time to be able to get great results for you. So I keep talking about local SEO, local search. One of the easiest ways to know that local applies to your business is to grab some of the keywords that you know people are going to use to search for you and then go do that search in Google and see what shows up. If you ever see a map pack where it's the map and the three results underneath or on mobile now, it's showing two results underneath. That is a very clear indicator that Google is using the local algorithm to return search results for that particular search. So that's a key indicator, but that local algorithm also displays search results in other areas. So at the bottom of this, you can click view all to see beyond just the top three. That takes you to what's called the local finder page, where you've got more than just the three results listed out on the left side. Or you could directly go to Google Maps and do a search inside of Google Maps, which basically looks the same. But if you notice between the two, if I'm going to the local finder page, because I started by clicking see all the results from a map pack, this is the same search phrase. Now notice the radius of the map. This is the Dallas area. So that radius is pretty large. We see the whole kind of metroplex of the Dallas area up to really far north. If we go directly to Google Maps and do that same search, it's a lot tighter and it's more specifically just on the Dallas area. So understand that that visibility is going to be different based on which area they go to. But originally we started with the map pack and underneath the map pack, you've still got the regular 10 blue links that you would see in a Google search result. But because we know this is a local query, all of these results are also going to be localized. So the signals that affect your placement and your visibility are the content on your site, the links pointed to your site from other websites, the customer reviews that you have, and the factors on your Google My Business listing. Before we dig into that, again, I want to talk about something really important. Google is about to release something called the Page Experience Update. This was actually supposed to come out this month, but they've pushed it back to at least June. Google releases thousands of updates every year, but they're really small tweaks. Whenever there's a very large update that Google knows is going to significantly influence or affect the results of a lot of different businesses or websites, they're going to announce it beforehand and say, hey, in six months, this is coming. Here's what it's going to involve so you can get ready for that. This is one of those major updates. So like I said, it's supposed to be coming out already, but it's been pushed back to June. I wouldn't be surprised if they push it back a little bit further. Now, in the past, it's been more of a, of a penalty type situation. If you do this thing, this update's going to penalize you. Well, this one is more focused instead of on specific optimization or content areas. This is focused more on what it's like to use your website as a customer. So that's why it's called the page experience update. So it's incorporating the core web vitals signals, which I'll talk about in a second, and then other customer experience signals. So core web vitals are something that Google started talking about a year ago. And the three important pieces that you need to understand out of core web vitals are number one, LCP or largest contentful paint. That is the biggest visual element on that particular page that you're running the test for and how long it takes to render or paint that element on the screen. So if you have a slideshow on the homepage of your site and you run a test on the homepage, the largest contentful paint is probably going to be the first image in that slideshow and how long it takes to render that or paint it on the screen. 
Now, Google says you want to target 2.5 seconds or faster. It really kind of depends on your vertical. You always want to remember anytime you're reading very general SEO information, it may be slightly different for your particular type of business. So for example, I do work with a lot of car dealerships. Car dealerships tend to be very image focused on their homepage because they want to sell you this beautiful car, which means they're probably going to have a little bit longer than 2.5 seconds. Now, anything that's realistically five or six seconds or less, you're probably okay with. If you start seeing a first or a largest contentful paint that is 10 seconds or more, that's where you know you probably ought to adjust what's on your site and fix that so that you're not going to be in trouble with this update. The second bit of Core Web Vitals, first input delay. That's how long it takes for you to be able to click on something on the page. Realistically, you want it to be 100 milliseconds or faster. So most sites are in the you know 25 to 50 millisecond range. You're going to be fine there. Once you get past 100, that means it's taking a little bit too long for somebody to be able to click on that page. And that's a bad signal. And then the final one, cumulative layout shift. That's as the content is loading on the page, does content jump around? So for example, you've got that big image in the slideshow. If it starts loading and that image hasn't loaded yet, but the text shows up, and then as soon as the image loads, the text jumps down on the page, that's a layout shift. So it's measuring how many times the layout has to shift around as the page loads. You want the smallest number possible there. But then this update is also looking at customer experience signals. One of the big ones, mobile friendliness. You absolutely need to be on what's called a responsive website, which means it's not a separate mobile site. It's the same code that displays your site, whether it's on desktop or on mobile. Another bit of mobile friendliness is how large the size of your clicks are. I'm sure you've all seen it where you know, you're on your phone and you're clicking the menu and the menu has the sub menu and those words are so close together, you have to just really specifically touch it right because they haven't created a mobile friendly menu. So that is all mobile friendliness signals. Safe browsing. So if your site's been hacked and you've got Viagra links or you know links to porn sites or whatever on your site because you've been hacked or you've got malware on your site, that's gonna be a pretty big penalty for visibility now. HTTPS, secure browsing. This has been around for a while. It's been a minuscule part of the signal. Google's turning this up. Basically, if you don't have HTTPS, now it's gonna be really hard to show up in search results. And then the last one, intrusive interstitials, which is a fancy way of saying annoying ass pop-ups. If you have a behaviorally targeted, targeted pop-up where you have exit intent and a pop-up appears, that's okay. What Google's worried about is as soon as you land on the page, a pop-up appears that covers up content. That is not good user experience. Now, as a business owner, you're like, oh, I can do this and it gets me some people to call me or whatever. Think about it as a customer. When you browse the internet, if you go to a website and a pop-up appears immediately when you get to that page, what do you do? You close it. You don't care what's there. You don't even know anything about the business yet to even care what's in the pop-up. So those pop-ups are going to start to cause pretty major penalties in visibility. So you don't want to have them. You can test the Core Web Vital Scores with tools like PageSpeed Insights or webpagetest.org. I like webpagetest.org a little bit better. Uh, either one of those tools will show you those kind of scores and your page load speed. So let's talk about the things that you could do to influence your visibility and get better visibility in those local searches. So we're going to start talking about website content. A lot of people have fallen into the cadence of thinking that adding content to your site equals doing SEO. Because there's a lot of stuff with SEO that's kind of behind the scenes in the code or not even on your website because we're talking about links or things like that. So business owners, it's tough to understand what's going on there. So a lot of SEO providers have kind of fallen into that cadence of, well, if I give you content, then you can see that. So let's just keep giving you content and then you think you're getting SEO. But if that content's not targeted right or written well or optimized well, it doesn't matter. So Google doesn't care how much content you have. Google cares that you've got good content. Remember what I said a few minutes ago, it's not about just having an answer to the question, it's about having the best answer to the question. And you don't need 15 pages that all answer the same question. You need one page that's really solid that has an amazing answer. And McKinsey did a study recently that shows in this post-COVID landscape what the three primary factors are that people use to select where they're going to do business, where they're going to buy from. So these three new attributes are really important to understand when we're talking about content, because the first one is proximity. How far away is this result from my home? Number two, hygiene. What are they doing to clean that location and make it safe for me to shop there? And number three, 
is there enough room that I can safely social distance at the store or that there are not big long lines for checking out at that store? The really cool thing is all three of these issues are solved with website content. So when you're writing content, answer those questions, let people know. And one of the big key factors here is I always tell people, you need to make sure that your content is actually about your business because you've got competitors in town that do the same thing that you do. And everybody's got the same kind of generic boilerplate content. So how's a customer going to know where they want to buy? So make yourself unique. Actually talk about your business, why you're unique, why you're a better option than competitors. And then also make sure that you're including terminology that shows that you're a part of the local area so that people understand that. And here's a test that we always like to use. Now, throughout the presentation, I'm going to include links to some of the videos from my presentations that are my video series that I do every week. They're going to be blue links in the bottom corner like this. If you are writing notes and writing this down, make sure that you write these in lowercase because they are case sensitive. But there was a link at the beginning. I forgot to mention it, but it lets you download the slides. They're going to share it in the chat as well. And at the end, I'll have the link as well. So don't feel like you have to write all these down. You can get the slides later and get them all. But this is a video that's in all these cases, they're going to be videos that dig more into the topic. But this video really explains this test. And the basic concept is take your homepage or your About Us page and change the name of your business and change the city that you're in. And could you put that content on another similar business's website in a different city? And would that content still work? If it would still work, then that means it's not really about your business or your local area and it's not good content. So that's how you can test your content. And it's important to add that COVID content, especially because you want to answer those three selection attributes. And you don't want to just have a little banner message at the top or you don't want to have a pop-up. We already talked about how pop-ups are bad. So you need a dedicated page of COVID information. It needs to outline your COVID safety procedures and it needs to outline your alternate service options. Do you have times where seniors can shop safely? Do you have times where uh, people could come in? You know, maybe businesses now are starting to do things where, hey, if you've been vaccinated, you want to come in without a mask and you can come in at this time, whatever that would be. Because even though everyone's getting to the point where a lot of people have been vaccinated, there's a lot of people that are resistant to vaccination. And it's looking like now that the mask situation and potentially some of the social distancing and and size requirements of crowds is going to last for quite a while. So we need to answer these questions so that you don't miss out on any customers that care about this sort of thing. Another thing, I, I always like to boil things down to the simplest concept. Another thing that's really important to understand is if you want to show up as a search result, you need a page on your website about that particular concept. Now, it's not specifically keyword to keyword. It's more about the intent of what's that concept and you need that page on your site. So keep that in mind when you're looking at your site. Don't have one page as a plumber that talks about all of the services that you provide. You need a different service page for each individual element so that you're more likely to show up in search results because that page is about that sole concept. Another important thing, your content needs to sound conversational. So the easiest way to test it is to read it out loud. Now, I'm not talking about think through it. I'm talking about have somebody stand next to you and read that page out loud to them because you'll catch the things that as you're writing the content, you think, ooh, this is marketing genius. But then when you read it out loud, it sounds crazy. So the best example here is a car dealership. I was going to work with this dealership in Dallas several years ago. And before we started working with them, their homepage content sounded something like this. If you want to buy a Ford pickup in Dallas, come to our Dallas Ford pickup headquarters where we sell more Ford pickups than any other Ford dealership in Dallas that sells pickups. So when you're ready to buy that new Ford pickup, come to our Ford pickup headquarters in the heart of downtown Dallas, and we'll get you the best deal possible on a Ford pickup. Now, the guy that wrote that was thinking, holy crap, boss, we're going to rank for Ford pickups in Dallas. But every human that read it was thinking, what the heck is wrong with these guys? Another big mistake that businesses will make is they'll say, hey, we also serve customers in Richardson, Allen, Plano, Garland, McKinney, and they just list out 15, 20. I saw a site last week that had 36 cities listed in a comma separated list saying we also serve customers like that. It should be conversational content, like something you would say to somebody that just walked in your front door. If I just walked in your front door and you said, hey, welcome to our store. Did you know we also have customers that live in and you list out 20 cities? I would think something's wrong with you. What do I care? I'm already there. Same thing. I'm already on your website. I don't care where your customers live. And that stuff is not going to help you show up better in searches in those cities. So make sure your content is conversational. 
And then once you've written this great content, you've got to optimize it for Google. So you want to make sure that you're kind of holding Google's hand and saying, all right, look, this is specifically what this page is about by optimizing the important page elements. And you also want to make sure that you include geo optimization. So you want to include that city term so that Google clearly sees this is what you do and this is where you're located. So I'm going to walk you through these. You can do this yourself. Most of you are probably on a WordPress site. It's very easy to use Yoast or Rank Math or one of the SEO plugins to go in and have the ability to touch all of this stuff yourself. It's pretty easy to do. So first of all, the title tag. This is the most weighted, most important element on the page for SEO. It's what shows up in the tab up above where you're typing in your URL. And it's also what populates your blue link when you show up as a search result in Google. You shouldn't ever put your business name first because you're the only business name that you'll always rank number one if someone searches for your business name. So instead, have the targeted keyword phrase and your city and state abbreviation. Now, keep in mind, when I go through these elements, I'm thinking about one particular page. So that keyword phrase needs to be the same in each of these elements. You don't want to mix it up because you really want to hold Google's hand and say, hey, Google, you're a child. This is what this page is about. Second most important element, the H1 heading. Now, there are different designations, H1, H2, H3, H4, but you should only have one H1 on the page. And that's the big thick headline above your text. And it should be a kind of a conversational, not like the headline of a newspaper, expl explanation of what that page is about. Same keyword phrase, also city and state. Obviously, we already talked about the fact that your content should be all about you and your local area, so you should already have it there. That's easy. Most of the platforms out there allow you to customize the URL for the page. So always get that keyword in city into the URL as well. Example I like to use here, car dealerships. Typically, the default URL of a car dealership website for a used car page, for example, would be dealership.com slash search used, all one word. You'd be much better off with dealership.com slash used dash cars dash Dallas dash TX. So get those updated as well. Alt text on images is another important one. So back in the day, you can actually see old presentations I've done online where I talk about how Google can't tell what's in an image. So alt text is in the embed code and the alt text explains, here's what this image is about. In actuality, now Google uses machine learning and can tell you pretty much exactly what's in an image, but the alt text is still included in the algorithm. So it's a great way to add additional relevance and locational relevance when you get that keyword in there. The meta description is also important. Now, the meta description is behind the scenes code. It doesn't actually show visibly to a user looking at the page, but the meta description is what populates those two or three gray sentences underneath your blue link when you show up as a search result. So you should approach it like an advertisement. You want to write something compelling that's going to make people think, oh, this is the best answer. I need to click on this. So don't worry about stuffing your keyword in there because it doesn't matter for the rankings side of things, but it is a conversion issue. So you want to have something compelling and have that same keyword and location information in there as well. So if you've got more focused content that's better optimized, you're going to start showing up better in searches. And then we can take it even further by talking about inbound links. So these are links from other websites pointed to your site. And Google looks at these almost like a vote of confidence. Google assumes, and it's a pretty good assumption, that if you've got awesome content on your site, other websites are going to link to you. So back in the day, it used to be, hey, whoever has the most links pointed to them is the guy that's probably got the best site. But Google got smarter, and it realized that doing simply a numbers game probably isn't the right way to do things because you could just go buy a bunch of links. It now matters where those links are coming from. There has to be some relevance. There has to be some reason for that other site to link to your site. And because we're talking about Google's local algorithm, what you really want to do is get links from local entities. So local businesses, local websites in your area linking to you carry a whole lot of weight. And it's really important to go after those links. The good thing is, as a local business, all you really have to do is kind of old school marketing. Get involved in the local community. Do the things that businesses did before the internet to get exposure in the community. And those are the same things that lead to getting really awesome local links that Google's going to love and reward you for. So think about the things that you're already doing. Take advantage of those things. You might already be sponsoring the local 5K or a golf tournament or doing trash pickup on the highway or sponsoring a Little League team. All of these are really great ways to get awesome local links. But unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot because link building is actually the hardest part about SEO. It's very time intensive. It's pretty difficult. There's a whole lot of strategies you need to use. Then you have to outreach and talk to people. So typically, if you're really kind of getting at that more advanced level of SEO, this is where you really want to engage with an agency or a partner that's going to be able to do this for you. 
But if you want to learn more about it, I did do one of my weekly videos and kind of dig into it for about five or six minutes. So you could go watch this video here and learn a little bit more about links. If you're more advanced and you really kind of understand a lot of this SEO stuff and you want to get more advanced with links, I did a presentation at a conference in Sydney in 2019. And this presentation is really awesome, goes into really specific tactics and also talks you through the process of what you need to do on the process side of building links. So that would be really great to go and check out as well. So now I want to talk about customer reviews. So obviously, everybody cares as a local business about what kind of reviews you get because that's how you attract new human users. It's great for word of mouth. But reviews are also weighted by the local algorithm. Now, obviously, reviews are part of your Google My Business listing, but I break them out and I talk about them separately because there's a lot of weight there. And Google's going to look at not just your Google reviews, but reviews on a lot of different sites. So you need to make sure you've got a proactive review process. Now, there's a video here that really walks you through all the details of here's what you need to do for your reputation management process. But I want to hit a couple of the high points because this is really, really, really important for any local business. Most importantly, you want to make sure that you make it easy to leave a review. You can't just say, go leave us a review on Google because a lot of people don't know how to do that. And it's difficult to know that you have to log in, you have to click on the right thing and go to the right place. So what you want to do is make it easy. You want to make it very, very simple, idiot proof the process for someone to leave a review. And you need to make sure you ask every single customer. So once you do that, the, the easiest thing to do is go talk to past customers. You've got their information in your database, most likely. And once you've got that process in place and you know what you're doing, then you can go back and hit older customers that you weren't asking before. They're probably happy customers. They're going to come back and hit you. But what you want to do to make it easy is set up a page on your site. We tend to put it at slash review. So domain.com slash reviews. So it's really easy for everyone to know. You put a simple thank you message on the page. It says, hey, thanks for doing business with us. We'd like to know how we did today. Leave us a review on one of the following sites and share your experience. And then you give them options. And those links link directly to the place they need to go on the various sites instead of just having them have to go figure it out on Google. And then you could follow up with an email if you have their email address, depending on what type of business you are, or you can follow up with multiple emails. And in those emails, instead of saying, go leave us a review on Google, you say, hey, go to our you know, domain.com slash reviews page to leave a review there and follow up on that message. That way, you're more likely to get more reviews. You also want to make sure you're answering every review that comes in. Now, this is key because Google actually sends a message to a reviewer when the business responds to that review. A lot of businesses will only respond to their negative reviews and just not do anything with positives. Or there's other businesses that will only respond to positives and not respond to negatives. You've got to make it look like you're involved and like you care about what your customers have to say. So it's really important to answer every single review. Plus, if you watch nothing else of all of the links that I share, you got to go watch this one because you can see in the little thumbnail there, I talk about responding to a review and you're mad. And so I go, and I get mad and my skin turns red and it does the little cartoon whistle sound and smoke pops out of my ears. It was really fun to edit that one. So go watch that one, please. Just make me feel better about myself. Remember when you're responding to those negative reviews, your response is not for the person that left the review. It's for everyone in the future that's reading your reviews, trying to decide if they want to do business with you or not. So a simple, hey, we're sorry you had a bad experience, call us at this number, that is not going to cut it in today's world. You should already be reaching out to that person offline and trying to fix the situation in the real world. And a lot of times, if you do, they're going to go back and change that review to a positive review. But in the meantime, your response should tell your side of the story and let people know what happened without attacking the reviewer and just say, hey, look, you know, if you messed up, be honest, say, hey, we, we screwed up. We're sorry, but we did this to fix it and blah, 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 blah. But that way, people in the future can see that you care and that you try to do right by your customers. And don't stress out if you get a bad review and it takes you off of a perfect 5.0 score. Watch this video for sure. There have been a lot of research projects that have come out over the last few years that have shown that people don't actually trust a perfect review score. If you've got a perfect 5.0 score, you actually don't get as many customers as you would if you fall in the range of like a 4.3 to a 4.6. Everybody knows that there are trolls out there. Everybody knows that sometimes you just drop the ball and screw up. Nobody's perfect. So it's not realistic that a business is going to have perfect reviews. People aren't going to trust it. It's okay to have one or two bad ones. It makes you human. So Let's move on. Uh, the last section here, uh, I've got about 10 minutes before we got to quit. So we have time for questions. 
I want to talk about Google My Business. Google My Business is really the key to showing up in local search because it's what allows you to show up in Google Maps or in the Map Pack. One thing that I've always been saying lately is that Google is like your new homepage. All the people that used to go to your website to get your phone number to call you, they don't have to do that anymore. They can do that from your Google My Business listing. They can get directions. They can see photos of your business. They can read reviews. They can even read frequently asked questions before they ever go to your site. So this is your new homepage. You have to make sure that you're optimizing everything and making the best first impression. So make sure you're using your actual business name. Don't add additional keywords. That's against the rules in Google and it can get you suspended. Make sure that you're using your correct address. I know it seems silly to say this, but you'd be surprised how many times I talk to businesses and they're like, oh, geez, I typed that wrong and it's not the right address and customers can't find me. Now, besides just checking your address, you want to make sure that Google also has the map pin placed correctly because sometimes your address will be right, but the map pin's a thousand yards away from your actual location. So make sure that that's correct as well. Make sure that your website link is correct. Again, you'd be surprised how many people are linking to a 404 page or they've updated their URL to a new domain name and forgot to update Google. You also wanna make sure you're using what's called UTM tracking. Turns out Google Analytics is not really that great right out of the box. And one of the big problems with Google Analytics is because of privacy issues, searches on one of these cell phone devices they don't pass referral information. So it turns out a lot of the traffic that you're getting from Google on mobile devices is classified in your Google Analytics as direct traffic. Direct doesn't mean what everybody says it means. Everybody says direct is I'm typing your URL in or I'm using a bookmark. Direct is actually kind of the black hole bucket for traffic of if Google doesn't know where it came from, it just says, okay, this is direct traffic. So if you use UTM tracking, that forces that traffic to be correctly attributed in Google Analytics. So you want to add this string to the end of your URL. So whatever your domain is.com, Question, UTM underscore source equals GMB listing, ampersand UTM underscore medium equals organic. You want to make sure that medium is organic and in lowercase. That way, if you're going to look at your channels report in Google Analytics, this traffic is still lumped in with organic traffic. But if you put a different source and not Google, now you can differentiate. The Google source traffic is people that clicked on you in regular search results. And the GMB listing is people that clicked on you either in Google Maps, on the map pack, or clicked on your website button on your Google My Business panel. Really important to do that. Make sure you're choosing the right categories. You have up to 10 categories to choose. Pick all the ones that apply. And this is really important because category selection actually influences how you're going to show up in searches related to those categories. And be strategic with what you pick as your number one category because that primary category is actually more weighted in the algorithm. So you need to think about what you're going after and the implications of what you might be choosing there as far as how it's gonna help you show up better in searches. So go watch this video for sure. It really digs in. And again, I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can in so I don't wanna dig in too much. You wanna make sure you're using a local phone number. That's a key signal to Google that you are a local business. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use call tracking. In fact, it's best practice to use call tracking so you know what's coming from a call on Google. So you wanna put your call tracking number in the primary slot and list your local number as an alternate so Google still gets that association. You wanna make sure you've listed your correct hours. This is where a lot of businesses screw up because they change their hours and they forget to go update Google and then customers are upset. So make sure the right hours are listed. There's actually a special hours bit in Google My Business. So go to the info bit, Scroll down below your hours to special hours. It's basically your holiday hours. Instead of having to always change your permanent hours, if you're going on vacation and you're closed for a week or you're closing early because of COVID or anything like that, you can go enter hours for specific dates. Kind of like, hey, on Christmas, we're closed. You don't have to actually update your normal hours. Use the special hours widget and say on December 25th, we're closed. And it will temporarily overwrite the standard hours. So make sure you're using that. And there's a new widget they added called more hours that lets you highlight different service options where you're maybe open for different periods of time for specific things. So there's a video there. I didn't put the thumbnail in there. Sorry, you don't get to see my goofy face, but go to that video and watch it. It explains, but basically you have options like this, you know, access hours, brunch hours. If you're a restaurant, if you offer delivery or drive through like curbside pickup or pickup or senior hours or anything like that, these are really important to add because then people will see multiple sets of hours on your Google listing instead of your, your top one. You want to make sure that you're uploading lots of high resolution, professionally shot images. iPhone photos tend to not show up as well uh, or as often as the high resolution photos. And a lot of businesses kind of compete with 
general customers uploading pictures to their Google listing and those will show up. So if you're using those high resolution professional shots, they're more likely to show up. You want to make sure when you're putting photos up, include COVID photos. Change your photos that often. Don't have old photos. Show that you've got employees wearing masks or that customers are in masks or show that your employees are cleaning things or that people are socially distanced within the store. These are really important to attract those customers that are focused on those issues. You can also upload videos instead of just photos. You can put videos in there and it's the same size as a commercial. So 30 seconds or smaller and less than 75 megabytes in size. You want to make sure that if the health and safety attributes are applicable, some businesses can't get them, but some can. If you do have the health and safety attributes, you want to go select all the ones that apply. There's a video there that walks you through them, but basically these are your options. So these attributes will now show up on your listing and let customers know that these are part of the way that you do business. You should also be using Google posts. A lot of businesses kind of either used them for a while and quit or never started using them, but they're basically free advertisements that show up in Google search results. So you should definitely be using them. Now, a post, if you read anything online, it's going to say it stays live for seven days. That's not true. Google changed it. Posts will stay live and visible for six months unless you use one of the post templates that has a date range. Like if you're saying it's only available during this range, that's the only time that that post will be visible. So for the best results, you want to make sure that your posts are promotional. Don't share the same social fluff that you share on Facebook or Twitter. The posts need to be promotional. Remember, people are going to see these posts before they've been to your website. They don't know who you are yet. Don't share social fluff. Share something that's going to show why they should come to you to do business. And don't worry about the full content of the post. You can do 1,500 words or something ridiculous like that. What matters is what shows up in that little thumbnail. Because if the thumbnail is not enticing, nobody's going to click on it to see the full post. So you want to make sure that your text is compelling. The couple of lines that actually show up need to be really awesome. Now, I don't have time. I'm running out. we got to do questions. But I did a Whiteboard Friday video at Moz. It's about 12 minutes long. Gets really super in-depth on Google Posts and shares lots of helpful information. You can go to that URL right there to watch that video. You should definitely watch it. One quick note, don't use the COVID update post template because that's going to hide any other Google post and it's text only. So it's not very engaging anyway. You want to make sure you're using an eye-catching image and the image size that you should use is 1200 by 900, but thumbnail cropping is super wonky. So you maybe like crop half of your text out or half of somebody's face gets cropped out or half of the car or the product gets cropped out. It's really frustrating. So to make it easier, I created a Photoshop guide. You can download the Photoshop guide for free. It's just a direct download at that link right there. So make sure you get that if you're doing Google Posts, it's really helpful. Basically, it looks like this. Anything inside of that white grid, that's what shows up in the post thumbnail. And then the rest of the stuff, the full image is what shows up if they click on that thumbnail to see the full post. Last thing we're gonna talk about, make sure you're paying attention to the questions and answers feature. This is something that was added about a year and a half ago, but a lot of businesses still don't know it's there. Most customers, think that it's instant messaging. And basically what it allows people to do is ask a question to your business, but it's not actually instant messaging. It's a community discussion feature, which means anybody can ask you that question and any random person can answer it for you. And that should terrify you because you've got random people answering questions that people are meaning to ask directly to your business. So one cool thing is you can actually preload questions. You don't have to wait for customers to ask them. Take your common questions, load them in, and then you can answer them as well. And then you've got a pre-site FAQ page, which again, makes it more likely that someone's going to click through to your site. So also make sure that if you want to share that information, upload questions about your COVID safety protocols, social distancing, masks, cleaning, that sort of stuff, and then answer them. The important thing here is if I go to your listing and I go to ask a new question and I start to type a question in, if a similar question has been asked and answered before, or a review has content that answers that question, Google's going to automatically pop an answer up and auto-complete it as I type. So I don't even have to ask the question again because Google displays that answer. That's why you want to make sure you've preloaded all your questions. Also, by the way, anybody out there that hasn't seen this movie Sputnik, it's you got to watch it in subtitle because it's Russian, but it is the coolest sci-fi movie to come out in years. So last thing we're going to talk about, some fun examples of Q&A. Also, by the way, go watch Psycho Gorman. It is like the greatest movie to come out in the last 20 years. Perfect example here. We see questions all the time of people that are clicking the ask a question button and their question is, hey, what's your phone number? I need to call you. Even though literally on the screen, the phone number is maybe an inch and a half away from that button. Because again, people think it's instant messaging, 
And so they're instant messaging you to ask you your phone number instead of realizing they can just click on the phone number right there on mobile or just dial it in if it's desktop. So you got to pay attention. And notice this was this guy wanted to get his car fixed. And then there are no answers to the question because that dealership's not paying attention. Or you get questions like this that aren't even a question. Hey, your website sucks. And somebody else says, hey, I'm not a fan of it either. Probably a sign that your website needs some work. So that's a bit of a problem as well. And then I was doing this one. I like to kind of customize these and do them for the local area when I'm in a specific location. So I did this for a thing for car dealers in Austin. And I happened to pull this up and ended up this guy was in the room. But the example being questions can get multiple answers. And this question, the primary answer says, don't go here. Look at the reviews. I had a horrible experience. They lie to you and everyone else. But there's six more answers. When the business owner answers, it says owner in parentheses. And this is a much better answer. Now, afterwards, the guy came up and said, hey, I work there. I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry. He's like, no, 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 no. How do we fix it? Literally, we grabbed three people that were sitting in the front row, had them log into Google, go on their phone, look up this listing. And all they had to do was click thumbs up on this answer. Because if you notice at the time, the answer that showed as the primary answer was the one with the thumb up because the primary answer is the answer that has the most upvotes. So as soon as we had three people go like this answer, immediately, this is the answer that now shows. So it's a much better situation. This was for a conference I did in Boston at the hotel. There was a question, how are the room numbers ordered? And this smug dude, Alan says alphabetically and look at his picture. He's super happy about his sarcastic answer and we all laugh at it, but it's not great for the hotel and they should be paying attention to that. And this is my all time favorite one. The guy has since, changed this answer because he thinks he's a comedian. It's not as funny now, but this is for the, the London Eye, the big Ferris wheel on the Thames River in London. And the question is, do you have to wear a helmet? And his answer was, you don't have to, but you can if you wish. I believe Viking helmets are a popular choice. Really funny. Now he's changed it to something like, yeah, I almost fell out four times, uh, but it's like a totally enclosed bubble thing. Uh, but you know, it's it's funny. And, and I guarantee you the one and I doesn't want that as the first impression of something that you're looking at if you want to buy tickets to go do it. So what you want to do is preload all your own questions and answer all your questions and keep your answers upvoted so that it looks like this. It's an awesome pre-site FAQ experience when customers are looking at your Google My Business listing. So now we're out of time. I know that I sped through a lot and hopefully nobody's brain exploded from the information overload. And for those of you that haven't seen scanners, that guy's brain actually does explode because the truth is out there about how to show up better in local searches after COVID. And now I've given you the keys to success so that you can break out of your shell and do better marketing for your businesses so that your business will live long and prosper. So that was how to show up in local searches in a post-COVID landscape and beyond. There's my Twitter handle. If you guys use Twitter at all, I always live tweet the conferences that I go to. So it's a great way to keep up to date with current best practices without actually having to go to conferences. There's my email address. If any of you have questions that I can help with, I've got an open email policy. So it may take me a while to get your answer to you, but I will always answer emails. So I'm definitely happy to answer any questions you might have. And then again, there's the download link that I forgot to mention back on the first slide. If you wanna get these slides, that takes you to these slides on my SlideShare account and you can just click to download a PDF. And also special bonus for you at the end, there is a list of all the movies by order of release date. So you will have a cool movie watch list for later. Thanks for sticking around to watch the whole thing. Hopefully you learned something awesome or the virtual high five is going to be a bit awkward because that's all the time we've got for today's video. So you know what that means. Put your hand on the screen right here. We totally just high fived because you learned something awesome. Let's hope. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week for another episode of Local Search Tuesdays.